Here's a fun little project in Python if you like suffering and flashing colors. We're going to be making a multiplayer snake game. To get started, we'll create a game controller to handle the state and rules of our game. This will keep track of the map, which we can make as a 2D array, and the list of players. I chose to create a turn-based version of Snake, so we'll also keep track of the current turn. For each player, we'll record a name, current position, and the last turn that they moved on. This way, we can determine when it's time to progress the turn counter by checking if each player has moved this turn. Players will be blocked from moving if they've already gone on this turn. When a new player joins, we'll also need to spawn them on the map. To do this, we'll find an empty cell on the map and create a map cell object. This is a simple object that records which player was there and how many turns are left before the cell becomes empty again. We'll also update the player object's position. Moving a player will be very similar to spawning, but we'll have some additional checks to see if the player is allowed to move to that point, and we'll also check if any players have lost by being boxed in. If a player is lost, we can remove them from the list of players and check how many players remain. If there's only one, we can declare them a winner and end the game. The last thing to handle is how each turn progresses. When a player moves and we determine we can go to the next turn, we iterate over each cell on the map. We check if a map cell exists, and if so, decrement how many turns it has left. If this counter hits zero, we can remove the object from the map. I also decide to add obstacles when the game starts by randomly choosing a few cells and placing obstacle cells in them. These share the same methods as a map cell, but they remain on the map for the entire game. Throw in a bunch more helper functions, and we have a simple engine that will run our game. However, playing a game like Snake solely on the command line is a heinous crime, so we'll add some simple graphics. I'm really lazy and used a tool called graphics.py. This was definitely not designed for making games, but it allows us to draw shapes and colors by creating a window, creating shape objects, and then calling draw on them. To draw our map, we'll create another 2D array, this time of rectangle objects. Each time the controller map changes, we'll want to update our graphics to match. We can do this by looping through each object in our snake map and updating the graphics map to match. If it's empty, we'll draw the background color. If a map cell is there, we'll draw a color based on the player and how many turns are left on the map cell before it disappears. We can define a starting color for each player here to make this possible. I chose to have the cell get closer and closer to the background color as it gets older so that it appears to fade away. An important thing to note here is to reuse the graphics objects you create or at least undraw them and unset them so they can be picked up by the garbage collector. I thought it'd be really fun and cool to create new rectangles on each update call and very quickly ran out of memory. To finish up the visuals, I left some space at the top to draw player names. They match the player color and can be added and removed whenever the controller's player list changes. Finally, to make this window interactable, we can use the getMouse method to move the player. This returns a tuple with the x and y coordinates of the click position, and we can pass that to the game controller. Now we have a playable game of turn-based snake. Before we can get to how multiplayer will work, we need to understand a few concepts. First, client and server. There's an excellent video by Live Overflow about this, but for our purposes, a client is just the player application, and the server is an application that connects the players together and keeps their games in sync. So, how do we send data between a client and a server application? UDP and TCP. These are different protocols for sending data that you've probably heard of. I used to get these mixed up, but now I have a horrible way that I will never forget which one is which, and I'll share that with you now. UDP is unsolicited dick pics. TCP is tender, consensual photos. What does that mean? UDP is all about speed and efficiency. You don't confirm anything beforehand, and you don't get confirmation that you got your message back. It's useful when sending lots of updates for a real-time game, where if a few messages are lost sometimes, it's not a huge deal. It's used by games a lot. TCP is designed to be a lot safer and more reliable. There's a three-way handshake at the beginning to ensure we're on the same page, and messages are labeled to detect if any message was lost so it can be resent. It's somewhat slower and larger in size because of this, but it's better in cases that don't require real-time updates. HTTP, aka the internet, uses TCP for this reason. If you look at how TCP and UDP messages are laid out, you'll see that they have a source and destination port. A port is essentially just a made-up number used for programs to communicate with each other. For example, if I have a Postgres server listening on port 5432, its default port, then any data I send to port 5432 on my computer will be received by Postgres. However, there's nothing stopping me from changing that port to 5433 or 5434 or really whatever I want, as long as nothing else is already using that port and the client and the server are using the same port, we can send data between each other without any issues. 
On a similar note, a host just means a computer, typically connected to a network. For simple applications like this, we can use localhost, meaning that all the programs are running on this computer. A port helps define the application, a host helps define the device. By using a host and a port together, we get a socket address. So let's look at a simple example in Python. To send a UDP packet, we create a socket for UDP, then send our message in bytes to a target IP and port. That's it. If we want to receive this message, we can set up a socket the same way as before, but this time we call bind with the target IP and port. Now we loop until data is received from the socket. TCP looks very similar, but with a different socket type, and we have to call connect before we send our message. And also we can get a response from the server. We also specify a buffer size since TCP can handle packet loss for us. To receive this message, it's similar to the UDP way, except we open a connection before getting the data, and we can send a response back. You might have noticed that looping forever every time we need to receive a message can make it basically impossible to do everything else. To fix that, we'll be using async IO to run functions concurrently and handle a lot of the messaging for us. Async IO is a library for write concurrent code used. Okay, it lets us do multiple things at once, while in actuality, it's just bouncing between tasks. Since networking can have really slow wait times, we want our code to continue to do things while it waits for a response. This will make more sense in a moment. The basics of async IO are defining functions as async and then calling those functions with a wait. As an example, let's say you have two slow functions that take 10 seconds each. Typically, you'd run one after the other and it would take 20 seconds total. However, most of this time in this example is just waiting on a network response. Rather than running one after the other, we can start both at the same time, bounce between checking on them, and they can take about 10 seconds to run both. Additionally, async.io has some built-in functions for listening as a server using the syntax. We pass it a host, a port, and a callback function to handle when the server gets a request. This function gets a writer and a reader object, and we can use that to get the data that was sent and send a response back to the client. At the time of recording this, my project is actually broken here, but the goal is that the client programs need to listen for both click events and updates from the server at the same time. To do this, we put each of those in a task and we wait for at least one of them to finish. Once one of them does, we need to update our game controller, make the changes to the graphics, and then continue waiting again for those tasks in a loop until the game is finished. So with all that background out of the way, back in the Snake project, we'll be creating another Python script to act as the server. This will receive data from the clients, validate the players are following the rules, and then send that data to all the other connected clients. To get started, the server application will contain a game controller, just like the clients, but it will only make updates to it from client requests. This is where I leverage the observer pattern. Inside the game controller, I added an empty list of observers. These observers have a unique ID and an object to handle sending data. When the game controller does an action that needs synchronized, like spawning or moving a player, it loops through each of the observers and calls the update method to send over data. For example, when we create a client's game controller, we'll add an observer that points to the server. When a change is made by the player, the controller will now send that data to the server from the observer's update method. Once that data is received by the server, it makes changes to its own instance of the game controller. This triggers any of its observers to call update. To make this notify each of the players, whenever a client first connects to the server, we'll add them as an observer to the server's game controller. Okay, just recording that was really painful, but the whole point of all of this is that the game controller and its logic are completely separated from any logic to send over data, and they're linked together by this observer. So if your brain is massive, you might have noticed a problem here. If the clients receive the data and change their game controller, this will trigger their observers to send data to the server and it will endlessly loop data throughout the system. Additionally, the original client would receive data that it sent as an action back to it from the server and also endlessly loop. To fix this, we can use the unique ID in each observer to prevent looping. Whenever we send a message from an observer, we'll append the ID of the observer as a source parameter. Then, when we first connect to the server and add a new observer, we'll use the source to set the ID of the new observer. Now, the observer on the client and the observer on the server share the same ID. Whenever we call the update method, we'll also take in an optional source argument. If the source matches the observer's ID, it'll just return, since we know that this would create a loop. It's surprisingly simple, but this ID is all it takes to prevent endless loops. 
Now, to go through this again, when a client makes a change now, its observers still send data to the server, which in turn changes its game controller. This updates the server's observers, but this time the source ID is included in the request. The observer that points back to the original client matches its ID with the source and returns instead of sending over the data. When the other observers send data to their clients, they replace the source field with their own ID. Since this matches the observer ID of the receiving clients, the client's observer also return instead of sending any data back to the server. So that's the basics of how to make your own multiplayer game. However, this will only work on a single device, which kind of defeats the point. So to fix this, we'll be speedrunning years of networking knowledge in a minute and 39 seconds. Up to this point, we've been using localhost, which means everything is on this computer. To connect to other computers, first we copy the client application to another computer. Next, we need both devices connected to the router, so they're on the same LAN. When a device connects to a router, it's assigned a private IP address to identify it within the network. Now, local players just need to use our local IP address instead of localhost for the server address. We can use this method to run server applications on a dedicated computer and get even more FPS in our competitive snake game. Fun fact though, your router is probably a router modem combo. What's the difference? A router allows connected devices to talk to each other, makes a private network. A modem allows one device to talk to the internet, aka the public network. Typically, that one device it talks to is a router. If the other player isn't on our local network, things get a little more complex. Local IP addresses only exist inside the private network, so having someone on the outside try to connect to your local address would be like giving someone directions to your house as, I'm in the upstairs bathroom. Sure, that might exist for them, but it's certainly in the wrong place. They need your address. Your ISP assigns your router a public IP address that's used for connecting to the internet. Your router is really smart, uses something called NAT to keep track of outgoing messages and relaying responses back to the original devices in the private network. That's how you're able to access the internet at all behind one IP. So, can someone connect to the server with using this public IP? Almost. By default, most routers block new incoming requests for security reasons. The only thing that's allowed is outgoing data and responses from recent requests. To allow traffic in, we need to port forward. This is just a simple rule that tells the router, allow traffic on this port and send it to this device to be handled. If we use the port of our game and forward that to the server device, we can now play with our friends. 